Let me say, this, I think, elevates the message of the gospel from just a, let's make our lives a bit better, to being a, every single person that you meet is under the just judgment of a righteous God for their sin. And that's so serious, isn't it? You have never met a single person who doesn't rightly deserve, and this is including you and me, who doesn't rightly deserve God's wrathful judgment at their sin. You know, and I, I think that's, that's the sense, isn't it, in, in Romans 1 and 2, that God will repay each person according to what they have done. And that means that it's very, very serious. I, I think we, um, again, we, we also, it helps us to think about Salvation is not just a problem for us. In a sense, it's a, it's a problem for God, isn't it? Because if you like, in, in sin, we, we turn our back on God, yeah? So sin is, is the rebellion against God. We, we turn our back on him. We say, no, 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 uh, we're going to live our own way. We're going to do our own thing. And God, in his wrathful judgment, turns his back on us. And so actually, for us to be saved, not only... Do I have to turn around and repent for my sin, which I'm not going to do on my own, but also God's wrath needs to be dealt with so that he will turn around and face me again. And actually, if I, if I only think in, my hands are, can't twist too much, but if I only think in this category about me, I am missing, in some sense, the heart of the gospel, which is about God and who he is and what he's done. Bibles and turn to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16, it's on page 118 in those church Bibles. Leviticus chapter 16. What we're starting this evening is a, a short series in the build up to Easter, thinking about the message of the cross. Why is it that Jesus had to die on the cross? What does his death mean for us? Um, how has he saved us through his death on the cross? And obviously the background to that is the Old Testament sacrificial system, not least amongst which is the Day of Atonement as described in Leviticus 16. So this is the day that they are to celebrate together the atonement of the rescue from Egypt as they uh, make a sacrifice for their sins. And I'm gonna read it to us in Leviticus chapter 16. I've been told that the application of Leviticus to us today can be summarized in two words. Does anyone know the two words that you can summarize the application of Leviticus? Oh, three words. Sorry, I missed one out. Law. Law. So that's what, that's what Leviticus is. The application for us as Christians today in three words, hooray for Jesus. Hooray for Jesus. That was Justin Moat. If you know Justin Moat, that was his thing. Hooray for Jesus. Because as you read it, you realize, wow, isn't it incredible what has to be done in order to find forgiveness for sin? Our forgiveness comes through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Hooray for Jesus. So as I'm reading, you can be thinking, hooray for Jesus. And then we'll spend a bit of time uh, in open prayer together. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash round him and put on the linen turban. These are the sacred garments, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin, offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. 
But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord and to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household, and he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He is take, to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and to take them behind the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the tablets of the covenant law so that he will not die. He is to take some of the bull's blood and with his finger sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Then he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way he will make full atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanliness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. Then he shall come out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites. When Aaron has finished making atonement for the holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He shall lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place and the man shall release it into the wilderness. Then Aaron is to go into the tent of meeting, take off the linen garments he put on before he entered the most holy place, and he is to leave them there. He shall bathe himself with water in the sanctuary area and put on his ordinary garments. Then he shall come out and sacrifice the burnt offering for himself and the burnt offering for the people to make atonement for himself and for the people. He shall also burn the fat of the sin offering on the altar. The man who releases the goat as a scapegoat must wash his clothes and bathe himself in water. Afterwards, he may come into the camp. The bull and the goat for the sin offering whose blood was brought into the most holy place to make atonement must be taken outside the camp. Their hides, flesh and intestines are to be burned. The man who burns them must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterwards, he may come into the camp. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. On the 10th day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves and do not do any work, whether native born or a foreigner residing among you, because on this day, atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. Then before the Lord, you will be clean from all your sins. It's a day of Sabbath rest and you must deny yourselves. It's last, it is a lasting ordinance. The priest who is anointed and ordained to succeed his father as high priest is to make atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make atonement for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting and the altar, and for the priests and all the members of the community. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites, and it was done as the Lord commanded Moses. Hooray for Jesus Christ. Father, how we thank you that all of the things that you acted out in Old Testament Israel, you have fulfilled in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that we don't come to a tent in the desert, that we come to your very presence through your son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you that though that drama went on and on year after year after year after year, Christ Jesus is now seated in heaven having completed once for all the sacrifice for sin. Thank you that though bulls and goats could never really take away sin, Jesus' blood can provide forgiveness. 
We want to pray this evening that as we reflect and think on these things, that you just might help us to think rightly and truly. Not because there's any merit in thinking rightly and truly in itself, but because we want to think rightly and truly about you and who you are, that we might love you, glory in you, honour you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just before we sing, turn to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. I should probably have read this before we had our time of open prayer, but let me just read this. This is the, the writer of the Hebrews commentary on what we read in Leviticus 16. So the writer of the Hebrews is explaining Leviticus 16 to Christians, this sign of Jesus' death. And he says, verse 23, Hebrews chapter 9, page 1207, he says, it was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he's appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they have not stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would have no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It's impossible for bulls, the blood of bulls and goats, to take away sins. So we're going to think on that and reflect on that some more in a moment. Let me pray as we begin. Let me pray. Father, again, we've, we've, we've spoken to you much this evening, and that's a reflection of how much we need your help. So we, we want to pray now as we look at your word that you might um, help us, bless us. May this time together around your word be useful for us all, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the reason that I get you on Sunday evenings to answer questions in pairs with the person next to you is not because I'm trying to fill time or be lazy. I hope you understand that. It is because what I really long for us as a church is for us to be able to talk to one another about spiritual things and for us to be encouraging one another. And if I can do anything to sow the seeds of that in Sunday evening meetings, then I'm going to do that. Okay. So what I want you to do with the person next to you, or you can do it on your own if you really unfriendly. Um, I want you to answer this question. Why did Jesus have to die to save us? So imagine perhaps a non-Christian friend or family member just says to you, I don't get this whole cross thing. Why doesn't God just forgive us? You know, you know if you did something wrong against me, I would just forgive you. I wouldn't make you perform a sacrifice. Why does God require the cross in order to forgive us? Okay. Have a go at that with the person next to you for a few moments. Okay, I'm not giving you long because I want to keep moving. Anyone want to suggest an answer that they came up with in their pair or threes or however many it was of you? Yes, because he is innocent and divine. So that's how it, that's how it works, yeah? We're gonna come on and talk about that um, in a few moments, yeah? Justice. justice, yeah, go on, explain what you mean. Justice requires that sin is punished. Yes, so justice requires sin is punished. Joe, was your hand up? Yeah. Go on then. You were talking about what? Okay, yes. Yes. Without the, there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Yes, Hebrews 9. It couldn't be settled over a game of football. Yeah. 
Romans 3 says that he did it um, to demonstrate the righteousness. Yes. Great. So Romans 3 says that he was, um, it demonstrates his justice and he justifies. We are going to come and talk about Romans 3 in a moment. Maybe Mike's been reading ahead in the handout, perhaps. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm sure you haven't. Let's talk then about the problem of salvation from God's point of view. And let's talk about divine wrath. I'm sure we're very used to, aren't we, talking about salvation from our perspective, about why we need to be saved. We're used to this idea of thinking that we have problems that we need God to solve for us. We have sin, we need saving, that we are struggling, we need his help. But I want this evening, if we can, and we need to do this carefully because in a way it's dangerous territory and it's a dangerous assumption to make. I want us to think about salvation from God's perspective, not just from ours. And I want us to consider God's attitude towards us as sinful people. What is, it that, what is it that God is like in the face of sinful people? And the Bible's answer to that is that God is wrathful towards sinful humanity. Now, God's wrath is, is not like our kind of flying off the handle. It's not like a, a toddler tantrum, which I'm sure you all know everything about. You've seen kids on the streets doing that, haven't you? Throw, throwing their toys out the pen or whatever it's called. It's not that. Really, wrath is better understood as the, the settled right response of a holy God to sin. So in that sense, wrath is not, in a way, it's not natural to God in the same way that love is or holiness is. God wasn't wrathful in eternity past. He was loving and holy in his relationship with himself as a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. But when the perfections of God's love and holiness meet the rebellion of sin in sinful people, what you get is divine wrath, judgment, justice, anger. And I want you to see that that's good and right. It is right that God is wrathful towards sinful humanity. In fact, a God who didn't meet sinful humanity with wrath would not be loving and would not be holy. He would be passive and disinterested, maybe struggling with his own weakness or wickedness. But if the God who made us, the one to whom we owe everything, if that God is loving and holy in his eternal perfection, then you can expect him to be angry with people who rebel against him and turn their back on him. Sin is a, is a, a denial of God, isn't it? It's, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago, that sin isn't just doing a few things wrong. Sin at its heart is rebellion against God. And God, as a holy, loving God, cannot pretend that that doesn't matter. We're going to find ourselves this evening a few times in the classroom. Can you remember being in the classroom at school? How do you know that your teacher loves you and cares about you in the classroom? Maybe you've never experienced that in your classroom. But you couldn't, you knew, <laughs> Jeff's like, classroom? What was one of those? <laughs> School? Yeah, right. So we, you know that a teacher cares about you because they mark your work. They care about what you do. We, we know that God is interested in his world and is governing this world because he is wrathful towards our rebellion against him. His holiness and his love meet our sin and wrath is the result. Now, we don't have time for a super detailed consideration of the wrath of God, but I want to show you uh, three things about it, if I can, just briefly. And there are more things to say, but I am only going to say three things. Firstly, I want to show you that you can see it today. The second thing I want to show you is that it is being stored up for a day to come. And the third thing I want to show you is that it's personal. So let's start in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 32. And I've printed that out on your handout just to save you a bit of time jumping around the Bible. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. This is the beginning, if you like, of the, the summary of Paul's gospel message, which he has introduced in verse uh, 16 and 17. And then he says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. 
Well, that's just what we've said, isn't it? The, the, the wrath of God is his right response to the wickedness of people who are suppressing the truth. What is, what is it that is invoking the wrath of God? What is it that is making God angry with his people, his creation? Well, verse 19, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what is being made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, because they could, they could see his eternal power and divine nature in the world around them, yeah, they, they know that God is real, verse 21, that although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, which is what they should have done. Instead, in their thinking, they became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being. Birds, animals, reptiles, mobile phones, cars, houses, fancy holidays. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. In a sense, God's response initially is to, is to let them go. Okay, if this is the way you're going, off you go. He says. Because of this, God gave them over again to shameful lust for even women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves a due penalty for their error. Furthermore, since they didn't think it worth retaining the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. So God is, is handing, they are choosing to rebel against God and God is handing them over, handing them over, handing them over, and the result is wickedness, isn't it? Verse 29, they have become full of every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. So where is the wrath of God revealed in our world today? Where do you see it? In the wickedness of the world, yeah? You, you can see God's righteous response to the sin of people in his withdrawal and allowing people to pursue sinful wickedness. The chaos of our world is a sign that we are under God's judgment and his wrath, not his blessing. And so you see it today, and in a sense, we, we experience it today, don't we, in the chaos and the disorder of our lives, of our disordered desires and our disordered world. So we see God's wrath today. Secondly, it's being stored up. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. In Romans chapter 2, it's interesting. I think Paul imagines the, the, the readers of his letter going, you know, the, the sort of pious Jewish Christians listening to his letter in Rome going, dead right, Paul. You tell them. You tell them how wicked they are. You tell them how wrong they are. And then he starts chapter two by going, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean? He says, for whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. No one, no one can claim not to have done the things in Romans chapter one. We have all turned our back on God in that way. And what does he say? Not only is God's wrath revealed today in the world, but also because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. So not only are you experiencing God's wrath in the chaos and disorder of the world, we are also storing it up for a future day when it will be unleashed. Now that's really uh, similar to Jeremiah 25. And actually in several different places in both the Old Testament and the New Testament where God's wrath is pictured like a cup. A cup which is uh, storing up God's wrath and his judgment. So Jeremiah 
Uh, Chapter 25, verse 15 says this. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel said to me. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath and make all the nations to whom I send it, send you drink it. And when they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send to them. Here's this sense that they are storing up, have stored up God's wrathful judgment at their sin and they're being made to drink it down. So God's wrath is seen today, it's being uh, stored up for us. Um, So we see it in the chaos of today, and we will see it in the return of the Lord Jesus in Judgment Day. But finally, it's also personal. Now turn to Ezekiel, I think if I printed that out on your handout, it's me that's got to turn to it, you guys have got to print it out on your handout. So Ezekiel chapter seven says this, I think we're, we're quite used to, aren't we, saying, God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. Yeah, we, we like that phrase, don't we? Because it makes us sound really nice and tolerant. And it, I, I understand there is a sense in that, that that's right. But actually, when you read the Bible, you realize that God doesn't actually separate sin from the sinner very much. So Ezekiel chapter seven, verse eight, I'm about to pour out my wrath on you and spend my anger against you. I will judge you according to your conduct and repay you for all your detestable practices. I will not look on you with pity. I will not spare you. I will repay you for your conduct and for the detestable practices amongst you. So God's wrath and judgment is not general, but personal. God's judgment and wrath is not just seen today in the chaos in the world out there, but in here. God's judgment and wrath is not just being stored up for everybody else, but it's being stored up for me. It's personal. God is personally hostile to my sin, to your sin. Now, just before I go any further and before Joe yawns any more, I want you just to think for a moment with the person sat next to you, what are the implications of thinking like that or understanding the wrath of God like that for us today? Just have a think about that for a moment and then we'll come on to the second part just for a couple of minutes. What are the implications of the wrath of God for us today? Just just for the sake of time, because I don't want to go to go too late. Let me just say a few things. Let me say, this, I think, elevates the message of the gospel from just a, let's make our lives a bit better, to being a, every single person that you meet is under the just judgment of a righteous God for their sin. And that's so serious, isn't it? You have never met a single person who doesn't rightly deserve, and this is including you and me, who doesn't rightly deserve God's wrathful judgment at their sin. You know, and I, I think that's, that's the sense, isn't it, in, in Romans 1 and 2, that God will repay each person according to what they have done. And that means that it's very, very serious. I, I think we, um, again, we, we also, it helps us to think about salvation is not just a problem for us in a sense it's a it's a problem for god isn't it because if you like in in sin we we turn our back on god yeah so sin is is the rebellion against god we we turn our back on him we say no 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 uh we're going to live our own way we're going to do our own thing and god in his wrathful judgment turns his back on us and so actually for us to be saved not only do I have to turn around and repent for my sin, which I'm not going to do on my own, but also God's wrath needs to be dealt with so that he will turn around and face me again. And actually, if I, if I only think in, my hands are, can't twist too much, but if I only think in this category about me, I am missing, in some sense, the heart of the gospel, which is about God and who he is and what he's done. So let's look at God's solution to salvation in propitiation, propitiation. Now, I'm going to explain the word propitiation in a moment, but if you're with me so far, I can, I can, I hope you can see that it's not just our uh, sinfulness, it's God's wrath that needs to be dealt with. So God cannot pretend that our sin does not matter without changing his character. Okay, so God, that introductory question that we had, the idea, why can't God just forgive sin like I would forgive sin? 
Because God is God is the answer to that question, yeah? God is God and therefore he cannot pretend as if sin doesn't matter. There is a stored up personal debt against our name. And so God dealing with his wrath is at the heart of what salvation is. How do you deal with God's holy, righteous anger? What does God's justice require? What is the payment that satisfies the holiness of God and deals with his anger? Well, the answer to that we know because we've just read at Leviticus 16, is the answer to that is blood, it's death, life for life. God says to Adam and Eve in the garden that the penalty for sin is death, a spiritual death in the, in the ripping apart of their relationship with God, but also a physical death as their bodies give way to decay. In fact, it's not just a spiritual death and a physical death, it's also an eternal death, isn't it? In what the, the Bible describes as hell. In fact, in uh, Genesis 3, a sacrifice happens almost immediately, doesn't it, as God kills an animal to provide coverings for them so that they are no longer naked and ashamed. When the law is given, uh, you're given the law is given in the Old Testament in a way as a, a way to count sin, isn't it? It's a, it's a record of the debt of sin. It's, it's given to measure it and to ascribe it. And at the heart of the law is a sacrificial system whereby animals were killed in the place of sinners. So as we've seen in Hebrews 9, verse 22, it says, as we read earlier, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, which is what Guy quoted earlier. But there is obviously a problem with the sacrifices of the Old Testament, which is that they could never satisfy. Right, I'm going to take you back to the classroom again. I want you to imagine, and you, this is going to take great stretches of your imagination, but I want you to imagine that you got in trouble with the teacher, okay? The teacher was cross with you, and they gave you a detention, and they said, tomorrow, after school, Stephen Palfreman, you need to stay in my classroom for half an hour at the end of the day as a detention. So you go home. Next day, you're anticipating a detention, but you have a clever idea. You bring with you into school your hamster. Okay. And so you come into the classroom and you say to the teacher, listen, teacher, I know that yesterday I was, I was naughty yesterday. You gave me detention. You told me I have to stay back for half an hour after school. But don't worry about it because I've had a conversation with my hamster and they are more than happy to stay back and sit the detention for me. In fact, they are so kind, this hamster, that they have agreed to sit all future detentions for me. So I'm going to put the hamster there on the desk in its cage, and, and it will sit there quietly and sit all future detentions for me. What's the teacher going to say? Wait, wait, wait. Hang on a minute. I, mean, I know we've entered a slightly parallel universe, but anyway, the teacher's going to say to you, no, no, no. Your hamster cannot sit your detention. Why not? Because they are not equivalent to you. A hamster's time sitting on my desk is not equivalent to your time because they are a hamster and you are a person. Now, you're a quick thinker, so you think, oh, okay, okay, don't worry. Okay, I've spoken to my friend James and he's agreed he's going to sit in my detention for me. And he's the same as me because he's a human. He's not a hamster. He's a human. What should a teacher say then? No, no, no. James is also in detention. He's sitting his own detention, yeah. For somebody to face justice on your behalf, says the teacher, they need to be two things. What? One, equivalent. Second, innocent. And if they are neither of those things, they cannot face judgment on your behalf. And that is exactly who Jesus is, isn't it? The innocent equivalent who by his human nature, being one person with the eternal son, has blood of infinite saving power and value. He is both equivalent to us as a fellow human, but of infinite value in the person of the eternal son. So his shed blood is not only able to stand in the place of one sinner, but of all sinners who would turn to him. And this is how his death is then described by the New Testament. So Romans chapter 3, verse 23 to 26, where Mike took us earlier, is this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God 
and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now, just keep your eyes on that passage and let me show you three things about what's going on here. Notice that God is presenting Christ as the sacrifice. God the Father presents God the Son, Christ, as the sacrifice. In other words, this is not us putting forward a sacrifice, but God himself. So my, my teacher illustration breaks down here, doesn't it? Because actually this is the, this is the teacher presenting the sacrifice, not, not me or you. God, in a plan from eternity past, is putting forward his own son in human flesh as the sacrifice for sin. And notice that he's presenting him to himself. In other words, the sacrifice is made towards God and not towards us. It's made towards himself. God is presenting him to himself. And he does this that not only for the sake of our salvation, but also for the sake of the, the history of unpunished sins, sins that have been counted in the law, where, where forgiveness had been, if you like, role played in the temple, but never actually achieved. They are uh, they are held by God in his great patience and then forgiven at the cross. So, so all sin, both Old Testament sin, New Testament sin and beyond, all of that is only forgiven in Christ as God presents him to himself. Thirdly, notice that this sacrifice demonstrates that God is, verse 26, righteous or just. Those two words are the same in Greek. He is, he is righteous. He is just. He is he is in the right. He has the title of being the just one, the holy one, the right one, who at the same time makes other people right. He justifies them. He, he rightifies them. Yeah, he, he makes them in right standing at the same time. How is he able to do that? How can he both be just and a justifier of sinners? How can he both be holy and right and perfect and also at the same time forgive people who have done things wrong stored up wrath against themselves and the answer to that is in verse 25 and it's in the sacrifice of atonement literally the word here is propitiation it used to be translated as propitiation which covers two ideas one is the taking away of sin and the other is dealing with wrath God is propitiated through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. In other words, his anger is dealt with by Christ's death on the cross. His anger is justly satisfied. He has paid the price for our forgiveness. Our sins are then at the same time removed from us. The legal debt over our head is removed and wiped clean. So through his sacrifice of atonement, through his propitiation, the just, righteous, holy God is able to declare sinners just, righteous, and holy. Not as a legal fiction, but because their debt has been paid through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is about wrath. God's wrath being born in his body, the innocent equivalent shedding his blood in our place, for our forgiveness that we might go free. This is a, a quote from John Murray, which I think I've printed out on your handout. And I'm now wondering whether it might be add more complications, but I'm going to read it anyway. The doctrine of the propitiation is precisely this, that God loved the object of his wrath, that's us, so much, that he gave his own son to the end that he, by his blood, should make provision for the removal of this wrath. You know, God sees us. We are objects of his wrath and judgment. But for a reason known only to him, he loved us and gave his son for the reason or to the end 
that by Jesus' blood, he would make provision for the removal of his own wrath from us. It was Christ so to deal with the wrath that the loved would no longer be the object of wrath and love achieve its aim of making the children of wrath the children of God's good pleasure. There's a typo in there. So now the children of God's wrath become the children of God's good pleasure. That's an astounding change in us, even as there's an astounding change in God's wrath and judgment over our heads. Now let's just think for a few minutes about the implications of this for us personally. What are the implications of this for us personally? Think with the person next to you and then we'll just share our answers for a couple of moments. Go for it. Okay, sorry to interrupt you so quickly, but our time is almost gone. Let me ask you for, what are the implications of this for us? Yes. Right, yeah, so it makes unbelief a very serious thing, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we, we saw that, didn't we? Yeah. Anything else? Implications for us as Christians as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so the, it's not, it's more than just gratitude, isn't it? It's not, um, the gratitude ethic, I don't think, it doesn't quite always scan, I don't think. So this idea that we're so grateful that we're going to live transformed lives. Actually, we are so transformed by what God has done that we want to live these lives that he's given us. He's actually transformed us. And so really, in a sense, it's my, it's my joy and my delight to live out this life, isn't it? Um, yeah. I, I just wrote down three words I'll just finish with these because we, we need to sing and close but one is assurance if the if the thing that God has dealt with in Christ in order to save us is his his own wrath do you think that some small thing that you do is going to stand in the way of God saving you ultimately of course not because he has dealt with his his right wrathful judgment of your sin um, that's the, that's the sense I think in Romans eight. What should we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Okay. If I understand what God has given in Christ in bearing His wrath, then then yeah, I I have great assurance. It's the same. My other word was hope. My hope for the future is based on this in the present. I, I my my hope is that when I stand in front of in front of the Lord and have to give an account for my life. It's, it's not, he will say, oh, don't worry about your sin. He will say, your sin has already been counted for. It's already been dealt with. You can't, the penalty can't be paid twice. It's already been paid in Christ. And the third word I wrote down was seriousness. The gospel is really serious, isn't it? it this is not a self-help group. This is not a kind of, you know, let's make each other feel better about our lives. This is serious. The eternal existent God dealing with his wrath that he might save us. Let me pray and then we'll stand and sing when I survey. Heavenly Father, how we thank you that the Lord Jesus on the cross bore the penalty for our sin, that he took your wrath and dealt with it so that we might go free. Thank you that for no reason in ourselves we are we find ourselves to be the objects of your love so that you send your son to die in our place how we delight in that and give you thanks and praise and glory in jesus name amen